Politics in the United States has become interesting again. On the mega level, uh, we have a situation where rogue candidates, so-called, have arisen both in the Democrats and the Republicans, frightening some, pleasing others. And at the same time, we have seen the revival of a big movement from below largely involving black people, not just young black people, but older black people too, after a long gap in US politics. The huge civil rights movements of the 60s, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, after that, the Black Panthers, related organizations declined in the late 70s and 80s. Their decline was followed by a hiatus. Many people formerly involved with these movements either became passive or some sought careers inside the, Democrat, inside the Democratic Party. Some rose to become local potentates. And then we saw a brief flowering within that framework when Jesse Jackson organized the Rainbow Coalition to try and fight for the presidency. That was not successful either. For some in the African American population in the United States, Obama's victory was a huge triumph, but this feeling didn't last too long. It was a triumph in the sense that it was the first time a person of color had entered the appropriately named White House. But once Obama began to behave like any other president as he was bound to, disillusionment developed slowly but consistently. And then there was a period of nothingness, another pause till the killing of young blacks by the police forces throughout the United States created a new mood and Black Lives Matter arose semi-spontaneously but based on much community work in some areas all over the country and swept many, many cities, surprising the establishment which had no idea who they were and where they were going. So I'm very pleased to have in the studio today with us on The World Today, Sherelle Brown from the United States Black Lives Matter movement, who is going to discuss this in related aspects of US uh, politics with me. Sherelle, welcome. Thank you, it's good to be here. Tell me a bit about yourself. Where did you grow up? Sure. I grew up in a very small rural town called Laurenburg, North Carolina. A population, I believe, somewhere below 15,000. Um, nothing to do but kind of get in trouble. There's Walmart and cows and, 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 and funeral parlors. Um, and I, I grew up in a, a very uh, low income area with grandparents. Um, and this is kind of also where I got my start in organizing work. One day when I was 17, I came home from my job as a waitress at Pizza Hut. Um, and I would come home every day, feed my grandfather, give him his medicine, and check on my brothers who were often outside on the stoop with our cousins playing music, you know, doing things what young boys do. Um, and I remember one evening coming in and uh, checking on my brothers. Um, they were outside playing music very loudly and cops came by. And they said, there's been kind of some complaints about the noise level. Um, I'm not exactly sure what ensued next, but there was some kind of tension in the next thing. I know cops were kind of in uh, my cousins and brothers' face and there was some arguing back and forth. Uh, at one point, a cop slammed my cousin to the ground and uh, my brother started crying. And the cop said, do you want to be pacified, nigga, to my little brother? Um, at this point, my cousin, who was angered, rushed to push the cop away, and he drew a gun and, and shot my cousin and killed him. Um, and I remember at the time, I think the cop got like two weeks paid vacation or something. Um, Israel, were you there? Did you witness this? I did. I did. Um, and police brutality and violence by the hands of the police on members of the black community was kind of something that became a, a sort of stitch in our cultural fabric. It was something that we kind of just learned happens. Um, and there's nothing you can do about it. So you have this, this, this anger, but then you just have this acceptance, like that's just the way things are. 
Uh, it wasn't until I went to college, North Carolina A&T State University, home of the A&T Four Sit-Ins that happened in the 60s, um, that I learned that you can do something about it. I heard about this thing called community organizing and police accountability and was sort of trained up um, uh, by Reverend Nelson Johnson as a, a student organizer uh, and started doing work around police accountability and environmental racism. So that's kind of where I got my start. So, but this was a traumatic experience, watching your cousin choke dead. It was, it was. Um, but again, growing up and, and seeing this often happen, uh, at least the, the police violence, maybe not to this level, you just kind of learn that it, it's the way it is. Um, so I think for years, many of us kind of suppressed it, and we, we didn't talk about it much. Because um, you, uh, you also kind of accept it, or we did at least, that maybe he did something wrong, maybe he shouldn't have mouthed off, maybe, you know, wrong place, wrong time. Uh, in fact, those were many of the sentiments that a lot of us spoke. It was kind of a defense mechanism. If we can accept some kind of responsibility in this, then maybe we can also stop it next time. This was a small town in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what was the ratio of black to whites in, that, in this tiny town? Maybe nearly 30% black, um, probably 60% white, um, with some in between Native American. There's like a Lumbee tribe. It's, it's pretty big in that area. Um, and it's a town that is pretty racially divided. There's literally train tracks that kind of divide the white side of town and the black side of town. Still to this day, it's, it's yeah. like that. And it's a very conservative place. So after you went to university, mm -hmm. uh, what, do, what did you do? So I started out, believe it or not, majoring in marketing and business because I thought that I wanted to be a, a, a marketing person. And then I, you know, down with capitalism later, of course. And then I switched to political science after uh, becoming a, a, a student campaigner for the Obama campaign in 2008, which was actually my prerequisite to student organizing. Um, so you, the campaign excited you? Yeah, it did, it did. It galvanized me and a lot of other students. And I, I thought, look at this energy that a lot of young people have. Um, there has to be a way we can harness this and continue to, to keep it going. Um, so working on Obama's campaign, no matter how disillusioned I got <laughs> with it later on. But at that time, it kind of opened up this world of like activism and engagement uh, and, and, and civic engagement at the time. Um, so his campaign was kind of also my introduction into the organizing space. I realized the power that we had as students, as young people, to kind of really impact and affect change. Uh, and it led to me working on other campaigns at the local level, um, and then it kind of switched from electoral campaigns to more issue-based campaigns. Tell us now about Black Lives Matter. I know that there are different experiences in different parts of yes. the country, but mm -hmm. effectively uh, it developed out of the killing in Ferguson. Yeah, so the, the story of Black Lives Matter uh, is very layered. Uh, for one, there is a difference that I think needs to be named between sort of the movement Black Lives Matter <laughs> and of course the, the organization. Black Lives Matter organization, which was started by three brilliant sisters, Alicia, Opal, and Patrice, uh, after the killing of Trayvon Martin in Florida. Um, and uh, then this hashtag kind of came about along with the organization that has chapters all across the states, and I think some in Canada as well. Um, but we saw it kind of take off in Ferguson after young folks kind of took to the streets because they were just tired of waiting. And it was, it was a beautiful and resilient moment. And I always tell people that the movement didn't start with Ferguson, but it was certainly a, a baptismal moment, right? Um, black liberation has been kind of this ebb and flow thing for the last 500 years with different incarnations. Um, and I think uh, within my memory in the last 10 years, the first thing I remember is, is Oscar Grant happening. This was kind of before social media. Um, but I remember people taking to the streets then. But it wasn't documented in the same way. And then Troy Davis happened, and it was kind of the first campaign I saw that played out on social media with the Too Much Doubt hashtag. And people were really questioning you know, the death penalty and, and racial biases within the criminal justice system. And I saw social media having this real integral role in kind of galvanizing uh, people's interest in these campaigns. And then Trayvon Martin happened and uh, groups like the Dream Defenders did excellent actions where they kind of like took over the Capitol. Um, but then Mike Brown was killed and it was like then nothing. What happened? Mike Brown was killed in Ferguson 
in August, and I think that was, it was like a tipping point. Um, it, it, was, it was so amazing. I think without, I definitely have to give all uh, recognition and props to the young folks in Ferguson who just kind of like took it into their hands, you know? Uh, it was such a, a, a dynamic moment in the history of black liberation movements and kind of like took us to this next point that we're in now, this next phase of Black Lives Matter. And then were you surprised? Where were you at this time, in New York? I was. Um, I was in New York working for Equal Justice USA, which is a, a criminal justice reform organization. Um, my role was to, to work with different states in repealing the death penalty through uh, repeal bills. Um, but I was watching this play out like everyone else on Twitter before any of the news stations got there. And I seen a young man's body just laying in the streets for four and a half hours. And of course, with my history, that kind of like, you know, pulled out some real emotions for me. Um, and I just knew that I, I wanted to somehow be a part of, 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 of helping or building up capacity, doing whatever I could do. Um, so I flew down to Ferguson, I think a few days later, um, and volunteered with Organization for Black Struggle, uh, which is this amazing historical organization doing brilliant work. The demonstration in New York that took place in New York, which closed the bridges, was quite astonishing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, some people I spoke to in New York said it was spontaneous, but I don't believe, I mean, of course it was on one level it was spontaneous, but a great deal of organization must have gone into it when you really closed down the city, more or less. Of course. I think that it's a little of both. Of course, there's some spontaneity in it. People sometimes just, just kind of automatically take to the streets and gather and say, let's, what are we going to do? Um, there was also uh, dope organizations like Black Youth Project 100 um, out planning and, and New York Justice League out planning some of these things and kind of helping facilitate the crowd at least a little bit. So we have these organic crowds gathering in mass. And then you had organizations also kind of helping corral and kind of like maneuver and be strategic about the moves of the day. Um, so you had the bridge shut down, which was amazing. amazing. And then you, you had the economic shutdowns where <laughs> people were taking to the Apple Store and Macy's and Highways and the Barclays Center when the, uh, when Prince, uh, when the Prince and I think Kate Middleton and Prince Charles were there. Um, and it was beautiful, it was like every day <laughs> something was getting shut down and causing a nuisance. Uh, and then you had Black Brunch, which became this really popular thing where um, activists kind of took to these like really, you know, upscale brunch spots to really interrupt and make people uncomfortable um, and bring the facts about Black Lives Matter and how every 28 hours a black person is killed by a police or a vigilante. Um, and I think it was great because you had people saying, well, well why are you here at brunch interrupting us? We, we're not a part of the problem. Um, the fact that they kind of wanted to disassociate themselves oh, from it. Please. Exactly. Um, <clears throat> it was one of the most beautiful things. And I remember going to one of the actions, black brunch actions, and there was a family. It was a really kind of like upscale place, mostly white patrons, but there was this one black family. And we went in there and did our usual thing where we kind of circled around. We would only stand there for three or four minutes. We would call out this call and repeat declaration, read off the names of some of the sisters and brothers lost to police violence. Um, and I remember this family standing up at the end and just like crying and talking about how they haven't really been a part of the movement um, and they often felt invisible uh, in these spaces, but like they felt really affirmed and recognized. And I just thought it was a, a, a brilliant display uh, of organizing skill. And that was led by a lot of the young people kind of, who kind of gathered themselves to to organize some of the actions. And Sherelle, as you became more and more radicalized in this period, did it send you back to read some history of black struggles and the black movements? I mean, not just slavery and the Civil War, that's part of the course, but I mean the sort of unofficial histories, you know, how state repression managed mm -hmm. to destroy the Black Panther Party, how Malcolm was killed, how Martin Luther was assassinated. Yes, yes. Definitely, definitely. I, I, I remember reading um, up on more of uh, MLK's thoughts on capitalism. Because you know, often his, his nonviolence is employed by people to say, be more like MLK. Yeah. He wouldn't have wanted you to do this, you know, in regards to the rioting yeah. and looting. Um, so I was really interested in getting more into like his critiques on capitalism. 
which is largely ignored when people kind of employ his, his history and legacy to silence black people. Um, and I read a lot about uh, some of the work that also went into like the 80s and 90s, because I feel like that's a period that is often erased. People think that we kind of jumped from the civil rights movement to where we are now, as if there hasn't been a lot of black liberation movement in between. Yeah. Uh, so reading some of the works from Barbara Ransby, who did this beautiful work on Ella Baker, who is one of my idols, and I think her organizing model of decentering self and, and lifting up community is brilliant. Um, and the work of Kathy Cohen, um, and just like really appreciating some of that radical stuff that came out of the 80s and 90s that often doesn't get talked about. And also, uh, reading up a lot about Malcolm X's kind of black internationalist work. I was especially interested in it after a trip I took with the Dream Defenders to, uh, to Palestine last January, and just how he was really intentional about building some of those connections uh, internationally, because I think that's really important right now to kind of make sure that we, we keep in mind to, to act locally, but think globally. Yeah, <clears throat> also the thing is that new movements arise in new contexts, mm -hmm. in new situations. So one can't just mimic the past. Yeah. I mean, you know, you can't mimic the Black Panthers or Malcolm or Martin. They were very specific products mm -hmm. of a certain political situation that existed both in the States and globally. I mean, America was fighting the war in Vietnam. Uh, which angered, you know, Muhammad Ali, Martin Luther King, and Malcolm equally. They were all angry and angered by it. And today the world, it's not that wars aren't going on, but it's that politics has changed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, also, white supremacy is just constantly growing. White supremacy is still deeply embedded. That we've seen. And mm -hmm. the, the, the reaction to the police killings from the majority population is quite staggering, or has been, till Black Lives Matter appeared and then people began to take it more seriously. But it's just casual. Another black has been killed, okay, mm -hmm. that's fine, life goes on. Mm -hmm. And your organization said, no, life doesn't go on. It may go on for you, it doesn't go on for us, mm -hmm. we're going to demand change. But yet, from within the establishment, Sherrod, either Congress or the White House, very little has been done, if anything. Right, right. And I think some of the proposals that have come out of kind of the quote unquote criminal justice reform establishment within kind of like the Democratic Party, um, often just extensions of neoliberalism, right? So, you know, we have suggestions about uh, police cameras and body cams. Um, but that's also more surveillance, right? So how do we get to a point where we shift from talking about reformist demands, which are important because we need to survive the yes. current system, to more transformational demands, right? Um, because while I know that we all kind of have this yearning to see uh, those who kill um, black people without, without consequence um, uh, face justice, we know that as prison abolitionists, there is no real long-lasting justice seeking, um, seeking that out in, in the criminal justice system. Um, so there's been real uh, conversations and critical discussions about how do we get from this point where we are now, where we're surviving and reacting, responding, to building out something very different. And I think that's really critical and important. And what do you think has happened to all the illusions that there were in Obama. I mean, after all, as president, he still has the power mm -hmm. before he leaves to order the release of the incarcerated population, a majority of the incarcerated who've been arrested for totally trivial offenses. Mm -hmm. Yet he's not going to do it because it'll upset the establishment too much. So how do you trace the disillusionment? I assume there is that. There is, there is, and I think that there's this recognition that even, you know, a lot of people employ, how is there still racism? You have, we have a black president, racism is gone. I think it proves that just white supremacy is so insidious and so ingrained that you don't need a white person in the White House for it to be perpetuated, right? It's so institutional, it's so systematic 
that it doesn't matter who is at the helm of our country, uh, it still plays out in our policies and in our laws. <laughs> I know a lot of us, I think, are, are kind of holding out and hoping that there might be some mad dash, like do a, a bunch of black radical stuff before he leaves. <laughs> but you know, I'm not holding my breath. Um, but I, I have seen a lot of people become more jaded over the last two years, the, 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 um, the reluctance to even say Black Lives Matter. You know, something so simple as saying Black Lives Matter, which is so hard for a lot of politicians to say, uh, this kind of desiring need to, to elicit the All Lives Matter thing, as if all lives are the ones being killed, you know, every 28 hours, or <laughs> having their water poisoned, you know? Um, I think has a lot of people kind of very, leaving a lot of people with a bitter taste in their mouth. Um, and also not really interested anymore in the two-party system. Because mm -hmm. what you've seen and what we see now with the current elections is kind of this attitude, especially towards black voters, that you have no other option but the Democratic Party. Who are you gonna go to, the Republicans? It's this kind of abusive relationship, right? Like, you're gonna leave me, who's gonna treat you better? And I feel like, the, you know, that's the kind of relationship that, that a lot of black voters have with the Democratic Party. It's very abusive, like, no one else is gonna treat you like I do. No one's gonna treat you better than I do. Yeah. On the other hand, what we're also witnessing at the moment is a political insurrection from the right and from left liberals. Mm -hmm. uh, as a result of the 2008 crash, the you know, conditions of everyday life, the Occupy movement popularizing the 1%, mm -hmm. ruling over everyone else, etc., etc. Everyday life in the United States is bad. And this is now producing a volatility within the US electorate that I honestly don't remember. I mean, to this extent, that we have uh, Trump, a, a billionaire twice over, who is, looks as if he could get the Republican nomination and mouths all sort of racist rhetoric, anti-Islamophobic rhetoric, uh, but at the same time, attacks the bankers, attacks the Iraq war for being responsible for the mess in the Middle East. This is on the right. And then on the left, within the Democrats, you have a challenge to Hillary Clinton, which no one imagined would get as strong and powerful as it is, with Bernie Sanders, who despite his defects, actually now is playing the role Obama was playing in 2008, mobilizing large numbers of young people. What is your opinion on Sanders? I mean, you know, I'm, I'm sort of, I, I get many different views from friends in the US. Yeah, it's, Most of them support him because they want him to defeat yeah, Hillary. Yes, um, I don't not support Sanders. Um, I still have a lot of questions before the election comes up. Um, I've also been not as close to, I've been trying to pull away from the US presidential elections over in the UK, but you can't help but also be engrossed in it, right? Um, I think that out of the candidates that we have, uh, the front runners at least, um, Bernie is the most preferable. But I, I do think that there are some things that he leaves me, me wanting. Um, and I think he owes uh, the gains that he's made, because I'm also surprised that anyone but Hillary uh, is even a part of the conversation at this point with her fundraising and you know, democratic machine She's behind her. She's already raised millions from Wall Street. You know, before she even threw her, her hat in the ring officially, she had funders backing her. So, like everyone else, I'm, I'm a little surprised that he's gained as much space as he has in the conversation, but I think he has, he owes that to the Black Lives Matter movement for building out this space where we're, we're taking a hard and earnest look um, at the criminal justice system, at the, all the ways in which Black Lives Matter are devalued and marginalized. Um, because what, what happens is, what's happened is people uh, turn and kind of question, recognize and question Hillary's role and responsibility in a lot of the tough on crime legislation that came out of the 90s, mm -hmm. right? And her role in incarcerating black folks and, um, and rolling back welfare for families. Um, and I think that a lot of those questions came out of some of the conversations that have started because of Black Lives Matter. And has allowed Bernie more space um, uh, and grounds to be in the current conversation. So I think he owes a lot to the Black Lives Matter movement. What is interesting, and by interesting I mean it's scary, is that <laughs> the more kind of right we move with the conversation um, and with all the gains we've kind of made with the movement, of course there's this, also this, this extreme swing the other way. And you have someone like Donald Trump who started off, <laughs> to a lot of us, as a joke. 
Um, but it's no longer funny. We can't afford to like laugh at the situation anymore. He's been able to galvanize, no matter if he gets the, the Republican nomination, and I personally don't think he will, but I think it's scarier that he's been able to galvanize such a large base, not based on any sort of economic platforms or foreign policy, but mostly off of his hatred, off his xenophobia, off of his Islamophobic um, rhetoric, uh, off of hate. I think that's where he gains a lot of his base. You know, it's like the farther we move this way with Black Lives Matter, the more people kind of come out the woodworks to gather around someone like a Donald Trump. It's, it's, really, it's, it's really scary to see um, how many people kind of gravitate towards his kind of brand uh, of, of, of rhetoric. It's because Trump says things they're all thinking, <laughs> yes. but they're exactly. not saying. Exactly. And he can afford to because he has money, right? So he doesn't, he often pulls his card out. He doesn't have to go to funders, the Koch brothers, and like fundraise because he has, he has money. He has generational wealth. And he often employs that to, to, of course, attack other Republican candidates about their needing to kind of um, be establishment oriented because they need the funding. And he's been able to kind of go off because he can fund himself. He's still funded. Mm. Um, it's, it's if, but uh, I agree with you on that, Shreve, mm -hmm. but Bernie Sanders is being funded largely by the movement mm -hmm. that has grown up. Yes. You know, he's getting a lot of money. Yes. From that, so that's positive. But let's just imagine what would happen if Sanders defeated Hillary <laughs> and became the candidate. I mean, whatever his weakness is, there's no doubt in my mind that were that to happen, a lot of space would be opened up for radical politics and to question and debate issues that matter. Yeah, I believe that um, that there would be, and I think that. Again, the, uh, the, the gains made by the Black Lives Matter movement, I think would also push candidates, whoever became the presidential nominee, at least on the Democratic side, would have to listen um, because of just the, uh, the, the incredible amount of mobilization we've had over the last two years and the impact we've had on changing the conversation and moving the conversation forward. Um, and I think I would hope that if Bernie did become the Democratic nom nominee, um, that he would give more space for some of these more radical conversations to be had. Shirelle, do you get any news from inside the prison system, the prison industry, about what is happening to young black people, what they're doing? Because before our talk, I went back and just looked at George Jackson's work. And George, who was killed in 1971 at the age of 29, had spent 11 years in prison. But what it was fascinating was to reread how he organized inside prison, how he got people to feel, black people, black prisoners to feel they weren't criminals, they could change their own lives by becoming political, by telling them they should read X, Y, Z, A, B, and C, and setting up reading circles in prison. Is there anything remotely similar going on in, 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 in the prisons now? It's a good question. I don't know to what extent, um, but I can tell you that in my past job uh, working against uh, ending the death penalty, I've had a lot of correspondence with uh, brothers and sisters on death row. And as sort of my work and visibility within the Black Lives Matter movement elevated a bit, um, and some of the brothers and sisters who what I would often write back and forth with, they would send me letters about feeling encouraged by the current movement and having these kind of really great critical conversations with others who are incarcerated. Um, and I remember, sorry, I get a little emotional. I remember one brother writing and sending me, he said, you know, I took all my, my the money I had this week, sis, and I'm sending you these stamps, because this is what I have to offer. And just in case you need to write letters to other brothers and sisters. That was his contribution to the movement. So knowing that <clears throat> our family behind bars still feel connected to the current movement and, and want to contribute in some way, feel encouraged, feel hopeful, uh, is really powerful, is really powerful. And, and I hope that it's something that's manifesting um, you know, across, across the nation. But I can tell you definitely that with a lot of the family that I've had correspondence with, and it's in the dozens, they felt encouraged. Uh, they let me know that you know, this is a conversation that is happening inside the prisons. Um, and that they're interested in learning how, how to organize as well. Um, and it's, it's really beautiful. It's really beautiful. Shreya, 
been very good talking to you. Thanks very much for Thank coming. Thank you. I appreciate being here. Thank you so much.